Greetings, and welcome to the CCF Foundation Managing Soil and Irrigation for Drought webinar. We wanted to acknowledge that today's webinar is supported through a grant from the USDA Risk Management Agency. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the view of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. If you're having difficulties connecting to the webinar, if you can't hear or can't see, please call our office for support at 831-423-2263, press zero for the operator, and someone will help you connect to the webinar. My name is Megan Donovan. I will be your host today. I am a program specialist at the CCUF Foundation. The CCUF Foundation advances organic agriculture for a healthy world through education and hardship grants, technical assistance, and consumer education. We are pleased to have both Steve Amador from Modesto Junior College and Rex Dufour from the National Center for Appropriate Technology with us today. I'll introduce each speaker in more depth prior to the presentation. Before we get started with the main presentation, I wanted to let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We're looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window on the left, which allows you to see everything the presenter will share on the screen, and the control panel on the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. By clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close the control panel. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to always keep it open. The audio pane provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting phone call and the dial-in information will be displayed. During the presentation, you can send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane. Simply type in your question and click send. Throughout the webinar, we will stop from time to time for questions and answers, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. As a final reminder, today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive an email with the link to view today's recording, along with a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. Today, we also have a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint slides available for download through GoToWebinar. Click on the blue file name in the handout of the handouts pane. A PDF of the slide will open in your internet browser. You can view them in your browser or download them onto your computer. To expand or collapse the handouts and questions pane, click on the triangle next to the name of the pane. For example, if you can't see the box on the questions pane, Click on the triangle and it will expand the pane to show the box. So we wanted to encourage you to test out the questions pane. Um, write in, let us know where you're calling in from today and what crops you grow. And we'll loop back around to that information a little later in the presentation. Uh, we also wanted to <clears throat> say that we have a nice crowd in the audience today and we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, but if we don't get to your specific question, please follow up with us after the webinar. And also just to note, um, we're going to be talking about some regulations around irrigation today that are specific to California. Um, but other than that, most of the content is, you know, broadly based for folks outside of California as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Steve Amador currently directs the irrigation program at Modesto Junior College and teaches a number of courses for students pursuing degrees in irrigation technology. After graduating from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 1986, Steve spent 10 years working in industry prior to entering the teaching profession. He is now in his 16th year at Modesto Junior College. Steve believes that the success of California agriculture relies on sustainable use of its natural resources, and most importantly, its water. 
So Steve, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And I will hand the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Megan. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, I, I uh, in this presentation, I, I'd like to discuss a little bit about um, how we can use our water effectively. Um, in the state of California, we're looking at the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act coming down the line. We're looking at uh, the Bay Delta model, Bay Delta plan, um, and uh, and use of our surface water. Uh, excuse me, our surface water. And, uh, you know, and I think th those are California regulations, but, uh, but nationwide or worldwide, I think we're looking at using water wisely um, to sustain uh, agriculture. Um, do I have control of the slide? There we go. Um, and so I, I think the, the the major goal we have is, is to say is saving water. Um, we um, in in so we save money. We uh, maximize uh, our use of our energy. We maximize use of our natural resources, and um, and we can just use our our, our water wisely. Um, and so, where do we begin? So today, I'd like to uh, I'd like to talk first um, to determine uh, how we determine water needs of the plant. Uh, analyze the soil and the water holding capacity of our of our ground. Um, evaluate irrigation systems for efficiency and schedule irrigation times and application rates. Um, I tell students um, that uh, you know I, I ask students at, at the beginning of every school year. Um, those students that uh, families farm or they're growers or children of growers. And um, I ask them, you know, how, how often how often do you irrigate? What do you grow and how often do you irrigate? And I get answers, you know, a week. I get answers 10 days, 21 days, whatever the case may be. And then I get answers and then I ask, how long do you irrigate? You know, and, you, and, and 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever the case may be. And then I ask why? Why, why are you irrigating every 10 days and, and, and why for 24 hours? And, and uh, the answer often is, well, that's because my grandparents did that or my father did that. They're successful. That's what we continue to do. And, and, and they were successful and they are successful. But I don't think we can we can um, leave it up to that any longer. I think we can't leave it up to past uh, or older practices. Uh, let's determine what the, the water that the plant needs. Uh, evapotranspiration rate for, for a plant uh, takes into all the water uses um, of that plant. That's measured in inches of water. In California, we use the CIMA site, the California Irrigation Management Information System, um, a very, very useful site, very user-friendly site, and we can log on and we can create um, create an account, and then we have um, a lot of information uh, available to us. Uh, the link is is there. Uh, as you see below, there's at the bottom of the page, there's a report I ran. Uh, the report, we'll zoom in on the report. The report uh, gives us a great deal of information. Uh, it gives us uh, the evapotranspiration rate. Uh, it gives us air temperature, dew point, wind speed, all of the above. Um, you'll notice that uh, this report uh, is taken from station, weather station number 71 uh, to closest to our uh, Modesto Junior College School farm. Uh, actually, it's about eight or 10 miles away, uh, but nonetheless, it's the one that we look to for information. I ran a uh, report from uh, a random week in, in the middle of July, and July being the biggest water use. Um, and uh, what is really important in this, all this information is the, I'll zoom in, is that evapotranspiration rate for grass. ETO is a reference that CIMIS uses for grass. Um, and so on the 14th, um, the grass reference used 0.28 inches of water. On the 15th, we use 0.3, 16th, 0.3. At the end of the week, uh, we add them all up and we use 1.8 inches of water um, for that grass reference. 
Um, if we take a look, um, uh, the picture in the lower right is um, some data uh, that comes from Washington State University's Extension Service. Um, uh, earlier today, I looked up, uh, I saw there were some attendees from Texas, and, and Texas A&M Extension Service has a very nice website. In fact, I, I kind of like the, uh, the Washington and Texas sites better than our own CIMA site here in California. Um, but nonetheless, uh, over here on the left, um, on the upper left, um, we have some data of evapotranspiration rates uh, for a weather station uh, on the MJC campus. And so that allows us to get more, and you know, it's, it, it's, it's expensive, um, but it, I, I should clarify that. Uh, I believe we paid about $2,400 for the weather station and our service, uh, our fees are, are somewhere in the $800 range a year um, it, to have access to this data. Um, but that gives us data on site. And so it's a little more, we feel it's a little more accurate. Uh, we feel a little more pertinent to our situation. Uh, but nonetheless, we, we got an ET rate or evapotranspiration rate for grass. And so now what we need to do is we need to convert it to the crop we're growing. Our school farm, we have uh, oh, about 40 acres of almonds and we're pretty much surrounded by almonds here. So the example I'm gonna use today is for almonds. It's really easy though to switch over to whatever crop it is that, that you're using. And so the evapotranspiration rate was for grass. We're gonna, we're gonna convert it over to an evapotranspiration rate for our crop by using what's called a crop coefficient. And so this data in the chart comes from the California Almond Board, and I believe that it originally came from UC Davis. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, crop associations have uh, crop coefficient data. UC Davis has a lot of California crop, and I'm sure the Extension Service in other states has a lot of um, crop coefficient data. So. In our example, we're growing almonds, and we're gonna, I'm gonna use the coefficient in July, uh, the most recent, the gold hammer um, number of 1.15. And so what that coefficient is telling me is that almonds use 1.15 times the water that the grass reference does. And so um, we're gonna use that actually as a multiplier. And so if we go back to the original chart we had, and we on the 14th, we had 0.28 inches of water, and we multiply it by that crop coefficient, uh, almonds are gonna use 0.32 inches of water on that 14th, 0.35 on the 15th, and so forth. So we could actually run an irrigation system and apply that 0.32 inches of water and meet the needs of that plant. Sometimes because of cultural issues, cultural practices, uh, you know, we don't want to irrigate every day or system requirements, we don't want to irrigate every day. So we can stretch it out. And if you look at the bottom, if you add those up, we use 2.18 inches, uh, almonds use 2.18 inches by the end of the week. And so at the end of the week, we could apply that much water. But on the other hand, Let's take a look. This is the water the plant needs. Let's take a look at what the soil holds. And so um, we can go to some general data and sandy loam uh, at field capacity is two inches per foot of water, uh, loam 2.7 and so forth. Um, we can use some of this general data or we can go back to uh, the USDA soil survey with the link is right there. And uh, the USDA soil survey is very user friendly and you can zoom in on the property that, property that you farm and tell you specific soil data and the physical, the physical properties of that soil and so forth. Uh, really handy is also a soil web app. Uh, if you just go to uh, Apple Store or Play Store, or whatever whatever you use on your phone, you look up soil web app and it will use as GPS data and it will tell you the actual uh, physical properties and the soil type of the soil you're standing on. So in one field, you can get soil data, move to another field, get soil data from that field. Very handy, uh, free of charge also. Um, but let's go back to the chart. So 
We're going to continue with our almond example. Um, at field capacity, when the soil is full of water, it holds two inches per foot. At permanent wilting point is the point when that plant can no longer pull the water off the soil particles. They are held too tightly and that plant will start to wilt. And so the distance between those two, the two inches when it's full, the 0.8 inches when it's permanent wilting point is 1.2 inches of available water. And that water is available to the plant. Um, I, always, I always like to tell uh, younger students that soil is kind of like a bank account. And so what happens is, is it, 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 we put money in there, or in the case of soil, we put water in there. And then we get, and we use that money in the bank account. And there's gotta be a day when we fill that bank account back up. And we don't wanna use it too low, or we don't wanna stress plants by going all the way to permanent wilting point. And so again, UC Davis, the California Almond Board and Crop Associations, they come up with what's called a maximum allowable depletion. And so of the um, 4.8 inches in the root zone, I'll take a step back. And so if we go to the other slide and we see available water is 1.2 inches per foot, and you multiply that times four feet of effective root depth in almonds, it's 4.8 inches of available water. And with almonds, the maximum allowable depletion is around 50%. And so we use half of that 4.8 inches. Um, some plants that are a little more drought tolerant, we can dry out that soil a little more. Grapes is a good example. I believe grapes management allowable depletion is somewhere 60, 65%. Some fleshy vegetables, um, the maximum allowable depletion is a little bit less, around 40%. Uh, but somewhere, it's somewhere between 40 and 60%. And so maximum allowable depletion, yeah, hangs right in that. We use about half of that water. And with the almonds, we're using exactly half of that water, 50%. So we have 2.4 inches readily available water in the root zone. If we go back to the crop water usage, and it's 3.32 on the 14th and so forth, and we average those out, it comes out to in July, almonds are using about 1.1, excuse me, 0.31 inches per day. If the soil holds, 2.4 inches, we do a little bit of division and we come up with, we have 7.4 days or seven days between irrigations in this type of soil. Again, this is a sandy loam situation. Heavier soils, uh, heavier soils hold more water and we can go a little longer between irrigations. Um, also, July is the peak water use month. Uh, August is really close, June a little bit less. Uh, May a little less than that. And so we can stretch the days between irrigation out in those months that use a little bit less water. And so um, <clears throat> at the end of seven days, our soil moisture deficit, or we've used that 2.2 inches of water out of the soil. So our job after seven days is to irrigate and put that 2.2 inches back in there and bring it back up to field capacity. Don't want to put any more in there. Maybe I should take that back just a second. We want to put 2.2 inches in there. The only issue with that is, is the water that we apply with an irrigation system is never 100% beneficial. It is never 100% uniform. And so we need to take now, a look now at our irrigation system and what what we're, uh, our uniformity is. And so if we apply 2.2 inches, some parts of the field may not get enough. If you, I see it all the time. If you I, you drive, you know, I drive to work and, and I see uh, we grow a lot of silage corn in our area. And, and you always see spots of corn that are near the road or in the corner of the field where in a high spot and, and they never seem to get enough water and the corn doesn't do very well in that area. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about with distribution uniformity. So what happens is some of those parts of the field, they don't get everything that they need. And so the picture on the left with the application depth there, that, that's a perfect situation. 
The picture on the left is what we have sometimes, where some parts of the field, the application depth is deeper than other parts of the field, and not everything is getting, really getting the water that it needs. And so if you take a look, um, and what happens with poor DUs is you see the dotted line in the bottom picture, all the roots got what they needed, but on the other hand, be, to get order for that to happen, we had to overwater some other parts of the field. So uniformity plays a big part in how much water we're using, how much water is used effectively, and how much water is pushed past the root zone. Um, and so let's take a look at DU or potential uniformity. This is put out by the ITRC at Cal Poly, um, the Irrigation Training Research Center, and, and they've done some research and they're saying that with, it will use permanent under tree sprinklers. They say the potential is 95% efficient or 95% uniform, I should say. And so what happens is in a system that is well-designed, well maintained, then we should be around 95%, linear move 93, uh, sloping furrows 90%, orchard drip 92%. I did an evaluation with a group of students last year um, and a brand new system in Houston on some almonds in Houston, California, and we found it to be 97% uh, uniform uh, in a double line drip. Um, and, and so, I think that's a good a good place to start is, is do some testing, figure out where we're at. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is um, is down in, toward the bottom of those, you see border strip or flood irrigation is 85% and level furrows are 85% and sloping furrows 90. Those are surface irrigation methods that really, in my opinion, have a bad rap. And uh, and I think, I think they have a bad rap because we, we don't always use them uh, to the best of our ability, but uh, flood irrigation, furrow irrigation uh, can be uh, pretty darn uh, efficient uh, if done right, often maybe not done right. Um, and so uh, let's measure our own uniformity. Three times a year, I like to go out and I like to measure uh, at the beginning of the year, I like to measure at uh, the middle of the year, and I like to measure at the end. And I like to keep records and see where my system lies. When I do those tests, I do. I like to do three tests in the field. I like to do one up by the water, the water supply. If you look at the picture to the right, with the circle, red circle, is I do one by the water inlet to the field. I do one that's kind of out in the middle of the field, and I like to do one out in the back corner because things change, pressures change throughout the field, and so forth. In the top left picture, that's a, a, an evaluation we did on some grapes, and we put buckets under the emitters, we catch water, and then we measure that water, and we see how uniform they are. Uh, and the bottom is a uh, orchard sp sprinkler situation, and we put water in the buck, catch water in the buckets, and we measure them. Um, when we measure, after we measure them, oh, very importantly, in the drip, um, the system has to be running before you start. And also the buckets must be under the emitter the exact same amount of time for each bucket to make get accurate numbers. Um, but once we have a representative sample enough to measure, um, we use plastic graduated cylinders and we measure the amount of water that the buckets collect. We then take all that data and we put those numbers in order. So I have uh, the bucket with the most water, 175 milliliters, and the bucket with the least water, 68 milliliters, I put them all in a row. Uh, we have a 24 bucket sample. Um, also, I measured these in milliliters. It really doesn't matter what you measure in. It's really pretty simple. You just measure, you can measure ounces, you can measure any volumetric measurement as long as it's all the same. Another thing, you know, I think Ewing Irrigation and Cal Poly ITRC, they sell cups that have uh, graduated sonars in them, and you can buy a set of cups, I think, uh, uh, for $50 or $100. And, um, but to tell you the truth, it really doesn't need to be that fancy. Uh, you just need a cup or something to catch water. Um, you need to be able to measure that water accurately, and that's it. Um, and so when I put all those numbers in a row, 
I take uh, in 24 samples, the lowest quarter of the values is the bottom six. I take the average. The average is 78 milliliters. Then I take the average of all 24. After I take the average of all 24, it's 111 milliliters. I divide the lowest quarter by the average of all, multiply by 100, and I come up with 70%. So the DU of my field is 70%. And so I think that's good in that that gives me some data at the beginning of the season. And let's say I start the season and I'm 70%. Well, that leaves us room for improvement, of course. But then in the middle of the season, if, I, if I'm dropping off, then I can make some changes and, 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 and get it back up to our original numbers. Uh, some ways we can maintain good uniformity, and I cannot overstress, overstress this. Um, keep the system the way it was designed. I did an under tree orchard in um, in Houston, California, a walnut orchard, and the distribution uniformity was 40%. Uh, after we did it, uh, we started looking around and we found that in the field, there were seven different brands of sprinklers they were using with seven different nozzle sizes. And so what had happened is the system was designed well, the system was working well, a sprinkler broke, and it was replaced with just something random. And then over the years, the, the uniformity dropped off drastically because now we've changed it from the way the designers wanted it to be. Uh, keep them the same. Clean uh, your filters, check and replace the sand if you need it, inspect screen filters, flush your lines. Uh, those of you with drip lines, uh, I like to flush them every couple weeks. Um, if I flush them after two weeks and I still get a lot of crud out of them, then maybe I should do it every week. Or if I flush them every two weeks and it seems to be pretty clear, maybe I can stretch that out to three or four weeks. But nonetheless, they need to be flushed pretty rarely. Check pressure regulating devices. Make sure everything's working properly. Use flow meters and pressure gauge record data. I tell students to start the pump, start the system, Record flow through the flow meter, write it down, and write down the pressure at the gauge. And so if I irrigate today, and I have 40 pounds of pressure and 500 gallons a minute, and I irrigate next week, and I have 20 pounds of pressure and 600 gallons a minute, then there's, there's something I need to go look at. But if we don't keep those records and we don't um, take a look at them, I, I'm not sure how we can make wise decisions. Uh, check for leaks and repairs as needed. I know I've, I've talked to growers that, that drip systems are leaking all over and, and they say, well, what's the difference? It's, it's, it's watering anyway, and, and it, but it's really not putting it where it needs to be. Uh, surface irrigation methods, flood uh, grade level property before planting, um, and that'll always help your uniformity. Let's go back to our uniformity, our ALMA example. Um, so our soil moisture deficit, uh, the amount of water we need to bring it back up to field capacity is 2.2 inches. We just determined that our system DU is 70%. We do some math and it comes out to uh, 3.1 inches. So what we need to do is we need to apply 3.1 inches of water in order that every spot of the field gets 2.2 inches. So we're gonna have some spots that get a little extra water. So we know that we need to apply a gross of 3.1 inches. I have a pump that puts out a thousand gallons a minute and I have 20 acres. I do a little bit of math. I take the inches to apply, which is 3.1. I take the area irrigated in square feet, which is 20 acres times 43,560 square feet per acre. I divide that by 96.3, which is a constant, and then multiply it by gallons per minute. And in this case, if you see the math, it comes out that I need to run this system for 28 hours in order to apply 3.1 inches. Um, I tell students, um, this is my personal belief, that um, you cannot be effective irrigating without a calculator. That, that's, uh, if we don't know exactly what we're putting out there, 
and we're just putting it out there and making visual inspections uh, and basing our irrigation timing off of that, I, I think we're cutting ourselves short. Um, this is kind of a, a startling fact here. Um, so my current DU was 70%, and and so if we average 0.31 inches of water a day for 31 days, and we have a DU of 70%, that means we we applied 13.7 inches of water, roughly almost 14 inches of water in the month of July. If I make improvements in the field, and I get that DU up to 95%, or I replace my irrigation system and I get that that up to 95%. Then we take that same math and we 0.31 times 31 days divided by a DU of 90. Those plants are getting the same amount of water, 10 inches of water, but they're getting the same amount in the root zone. So we're saving four inches of water in the month of July. Another four probably in August, probably three in June. And so and so now you know in May, another two or three in May, now you're looking at you're saving an acre foot of water a year. Uh, that's 20 in this case 20 acres that's 20 acres feet of water and uh, depending on the cost of your water um, that's that's pretty darn significant um, on the other hand if your water is so cheap that maybe that's not significant then I'm not sure that um, this is my personal belief that agriculture needs to be uh, um, good stewards of the land and uh, and use water wisely. And as you know, regulation comes down and it's not agriculture's voice that gets heard. And in California, it's San Francisco and Los Angeles voice that gets heard. And I think it gives us much more fight in the discussion if we can say, you know what, we're doing everything we can as agriculturists. Um, uh, are, are there any questions? Thank you, Steve. That was a really comprehensive overview, um, and thanks for all the examples as well. So if you have questions for Steve, please go ahead and write those in. Um, and also, we'll start off by looping back around about who we have online, and we have some folks from Lake County, California, and Ojai and Tomeka, and also someone listening in from Nebraska. And then people are growing olives, hops, avocados, coffee, and winter squash. Um, <clears throat> so one question that did come in is you kind of showed those charts from um, different places that showed water use. Um, if you're growing uh, sort of less popular crops, where are good places to get that information from? Um, and so I, you're referring to probably the crop coefficient because evapotranspiration ration rates for the reference grass is the same across you know each state. Mm -hmm. uh, crop crops that maybe uh, are not as common. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of information on um, uh, grower associations, and I think you know almost every every crop uh, has a grower association. Um, if, if it's really something obscure and maybe, um, you know, find a crop that's similar. And, mm -hmm. and uh, another thing I tell all my students is that irrigation's kind of like a big toolbox. And so evapotranspiration rates in DU are just a couple tools in the toolbox. And in addition to those, we don't have time to discuss today, but some of those other tools are maybe moisture devices, more, you know, a tensiometer or a capacitance probe telling moisture. Um, uh, maybe doing some plant-based sensing uh, with uh, infrared or um, NDVI photography. But, um, you know, so it's, it's like the whole big picture. And so I think we pick something, we look at the moisture probes and we see how much water is left in the soil and we do some comparisons. And if it appears that we're drying the soil out too much, then maybe we need to increase that crop coefficient a little bit. But I do think that most, almost all crops uh, are with an association uh, or um, there is some data online for almost everything. Great, thanks. Does that help out? Yeah, yeah, that was very helpful. Okay. Um, 
And then we have another question. You gave your example um, on Sandy Loam. What are best management practices for heavier soils? Um, yeah, heavier soils um, are just going to hold more water. And, and so the the duration between irrigation days is, uh, you know, instead of irrigating every seven days, maybe we irrigate every 14. Uh, real common in our area, um, we're a sandy loam. Uh, we find irrigate, a lot of people around here irrigate about every 10 days. Um, I live uh, just south of here in a town in Hillmar, and Hillmar is sand, very, very sandy. And uh, you see them irrigate more often every seven days. And then in, if you go to the west side of the valley, Patterson, Newman, uh, they're stretching those days out to 14 to 20 days uh, because that ground's so heavy. Uh, the, the thing with heavy soils is there's a cultural issue here as well because you really can't irrigate you know, every day let's say, or irrigate, if you irrigate too often, that's hard to get in the field to do anything. And so um, it just uh, it just uses, uh, holds a little bit um, uh, more water so you can just stretch those days out. Great, thank you very much. So I think we're gonna wrap questions up for now and move on to our next presenter. But if any, if you think of any other questions for Steve during the second half of the presentation, please feel free to write them in and we'll have a second question and answer session um, after our second presenter. So Steve, thanks again. Um, and we'll have a little more time to chat after Rex's presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our second presenter. Rex Dufour serves as the California Regional Director for the National Center for Appropriate Technology, also known as NCAT. Rex's work focus and background is in teaching and learning about ecological pest management and ecologically based soil management. His work experience includes managing sustainable development projects in Thailand and Laos. Rex is registered as a technical service provider with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service in California and Nevada. So Rex, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, You're loud and clear. Okay, um, very good. So. Um, I'd like to thank RMA for supporting this work and also uh, thank Steve for an excellent presentation. Thanks. Um, I'm going to be switching gears and going to be talking to you about soils and soil management and basically investing in your soils as you would invest in, say, new farm equipment or maintaining buildings or training up uh, some of your farm staff and talking about what does that look like? And it's not just throwing down some uh, NPK chemical fertilizers. Uh, we need to do something different than than that. And so, um, and what Steve was talking about is critically important, particularly in California. Uh, we're facing a lot of issues uh, related to water. And as um, Mark Twain said, you know, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. And uh, we're looking, uh, uh, I think that's where we're heading a little bit. Um, but the irrigation volumes need monitoring, the irrigation systems, you know, um, whether low tech or high tech, you know, furrow irrigation systems, or if you're using uh, some drip or uh, micro sprinklers, um, Subsurface strip is uh, becoming more and more popular in California. Monitoring the uh, soil moisture is is very critical, and and then um, monitoring the evapotranspiration, as Steve outlined, that's really important in order that we use the water most effectively. But you know, one thing that's often forgotten in our uh, kind of focus on irrigation technology is what about the soil? The soil is where the water meets the planet or where the rubber meets the road, if you like that analogy. And 
if we're forgetting about soil health and how that influences the ability of soils to absorb and store water, um, I think we're missing a big uh, efficiency regulator. And if you're thinking about um, you know, putting a, most folks have pretty expensive irrigation infrastructure, and if you're not paying attention to soil quality, it's like putting a hundred dollar saddle on a ten dollar horse it's simply not as effective as it could be. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, how to make your soil the most effective receiver and storer of water. And keep in mind that um, right now in the US, we're working with pretty degraded soils. This study it estimates that about three quarters of the soils in North America, um, they're degraded. And going into that study, I've, I've read that study, mostly that degradation is due to lack of organic matter, which results in compaction problems, uh, decreased ability of the soil to absorb water uh, and to store water as well. And in the West, uh, salinity is also a problem. Um, and I would note that most of the civilizations based on irrigated arid land agriculture um, are extinct. <laughs> uh, we're the only civilization that still doing that. So, and hopefully we can continue to do that, but uh, some other things to keep in mind. As uh, Steve had mentioned, something called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, that's uh, a California state regulation. Groundwater withdrawals are likely to be restricted and some folks rely exclusively on groundwater withdrawals for their irrigation. Um, in California, we have a lot of uh, surface water infrastructure, the state water project, the federal water project, um, but the, Sigma, as it's called, is an effort by the state uh, to kind of maintain water tables at some kind of sustainable level. And so in the future, groundwater withdrawals will likely be uh, more strictly regulated than they are now. Um, the idea is that we're gonna be working with, um, if, if we manage our soils well, uh, that will allow those soils to more effectively absorb, infiltrate, and store water, and then more, and also nutrients. Um, and storing water in the soil is way more effective and efficient than storing water in reservoirs, which can lose huge amounts of water through evaporation. Uh, storing water in the soil is also a lot more inexpensive uh, than building more dams. So those are some considerations. Um, so one of the main drivers of soil function and good soil function is organic matter. And uh, we've come to realize this over the last 20, 30 years. Some um, soil gurus, I guess you'd call them, uh, realized that back in the 30s and 40s, but those were uh, very exceptional individuals. But um, as I said before, lack of organic matter is one of the reasons why our agricultural soils are not functioning as well as they might, and we need to get them in better shape in order to uh, better withstand some of the stresses we're going to be facing. Now, if you look at Australia right now is uh, literally burning up. The uh, size of uh, the burn area is uh, about the size of West Virginia, I believe. Um, if you look at uh, the fires that California has suffered in the last uh, few years, uh, last year's record rainfalls in California, as well as um, that, and those record rainfalls followed very closely on several years of pretty droughty weather. So we're literally, I think we're going into uncharted territory here weather-wise. And if up to snuff, 
then I think our crop production, our food production, and our yield are going to suffer. So, um, there we go. Um, Rodale did some interesting studies, long-term studies, um, and you know the focus with Rodale is on organically managed soils, but there's a lot of good uh, conventional growers that are uh, extremely exceptional uh, soil stewards. But uh, what we're talking about here is well-managed soils, and well-managed soils can better withstand and yield during um, a moderate drought year. Um, than conventionally managed soils. And it's pretty interesting to see the side-by-side -side comparisons. Um, it's the same soil, just managed differently. And on the organic side or the well-managed soil side, it's not only that the soils store, have the ability to absorb and store more water just because they have more organic matter, but there's more biology in the soils aid the plant's roots in accessing a larger volume uh, for water and nutrients. So it's kind of a double uh, positive, you know, soils can absorb and store more water, but then they have more biology um, through times of stress. Sorry, uh, these are these slides are moving slower than I thought. Okay, sorry for the hold up there. There are some basic principles um, that, that are based on regular additions of organic matter, just lessons from nature. You know, like uh, why do the Great Plains, why do um, forest soils not need any fertilizer? Well, um, they're recycling uh, a lot of organic matter. So, uh, regular additions of organic matter in diverse uh, kinds of sources. Um, I think soil at all time. Uh, a lot of folks don't realize that plants exude up to 30 percent or more of all their photosynthesis. Uh, they exude those out from their roots and that supports a very complex and diverse soil ecology that we're just now um, um, And protect the soil surface, you know, living plants or mulch, you know, having cover crops, mulch, um, irrigation water, uh, sprinkler irrigation water, you know, you have these little water drops that are essentially water bombs and they can disaggregate the soil particles quite easily. And once you have that, um, you're, uh, you're not going to be absorbing uh, and storing water very well at all. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. But um, having a protected soil surface, either through living plants or mulch, uh, it, it also insulates the soil from extremes of temperature and, and sunlight, you know, bare sunlight. Um, whether you're in California or Texas or Florida or anywhere, um, the soil microbiology doesn't really like extremes of temperature, and so you just want to uh, eventually degrades into some organic matter that helps the soil as well. And keeping soil disturbance to a minimum, uh, physical tillage, uh, physical disturbance meaning tillage, um, that has a negative effect on the organic matter, on a lot of the soil e ecology. I mean, if you're a worm and you see a, a a tillage implement coming down your way, you know, it's like having an earthquake and a, uh, and a tornado at the same time, I guess, as well. Um, and that includes pesticides, fertilizers, you know, uh, 
our the organic matter in our soils uh, it's decreased and decreased by tillage because that kind of exposes uh, brings in more oxygen so the the carbon can be oxidized um, but over the years in there uh, really is literally like adding gasoline to the fire because it gives the bacteria a lot more fuel to uh, expend on eating up the organic matter, what little organic matter is left. So it's kind of a double negative whammy. So just keep the disturbance, chemical or physical, to a minimum and, and including animals if possible because animals can add a lot of biology through their manure, through their um, urine, and also if well managed, uh, through their hoof action, you know, trampling plants, trampling uh, thatch and things like that. So what's the payoff? For adding organic matter. Well, um, it's better infiltration of rainwater and irrigation water for, for one. Uh, there's a study that was done a couple decades ago by Huck, that's H-U-Y-C-K, Huck et al., 2003 in a, a sustainable agricultural farming systems research here in Davis, California, that showed that cover crop ground increased summer infiltration, that's irrigation water, uh, it doubled summer enough by a factor of 10. And so imagine in the recent uh, flood year, uh, this last year, if you could decrease the runoff that's going down into the rivers, instead it's going down into the root zone, into the water table. That's a win for everybody. Um, you have increased and improved nutrient cycling. Decreased soil erosion from wind and rain because of the better as well as uh, protected um, soil surface and also the organic matter resists as well uh, so if you have a heavy clay soil the more organic matter uh, you put in there uh, the better you can resist uh, compaction which is a problem not just for clay but also for other kinds of soils and then um, I've talked to several farmers uh, walnut and almond farmers that uh, have used cover crops to dramatically reduce their nematode problems, particularly in sandy soils. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of payoff for adding organic matter to your soils. And then um, Steve was talking about you know the the typical soil storage ability of uh, water capacity of of various soils. Really, the only way you can increase that uh, water holding capacity in the soils is to add organic matter. And um, this is simple, you know, for every 1% increase in organic matter, particularly in sandy soils, you can add another 25,000 gallons per acre of water holding capacity. Sounds like a lot spread over an acre, it isn't that much, but um, sometimes it can make a difference between having a good yield or a bad yield, or it gives you a little bit of leeway if your pump breaks or if your irrigation system uh, breaks down some for some reason, or if uh, for some reason um, your local irrigation district um, doesn't send water your way for whatever reason. And so, and there's a, what's the cost of ignoring soil? What is the cost? Okay. Now here's a couple of pictures. Um, there's rainwater or irrigation water. The picture on the right is a picture I, um, I want orchard floor. Uh, the, this orchardist uh, maintains pretty clean conditions, uh, nothing growing in the alleys. And this is after, you know, a few days after rain, there's been um, 
the soil has been disaggregated and uh, the, the clay particles have gone to the surface and it, it seals the soil, it literally seals the soil. So you have a condition that uh, is illustrated on the left side. Um, you have ponding in these orchards and I've seen this time and time again uh, over the years. Uh, these orchards pond and that water is, some of it will slowly, slowly infiltrate into the water table and into the root zone, but a lot of it will evaporate off a lot, of it, a lot of it will run off and not make it back into the water table where we really need it and want it. Um, and so, and in addition, that water is carrying off uh, fine clay particles, oftentimes uh, that have uh, phosphorus adsorbed onto the surface. So you're losing nutrients. You're uh, literally polluting some of the downstream waters, whether it's your neighbor's farm or some river or pond or lake. And so um, it's kind of a lose, lose, lose situation. Uh, you have ever decreasing water storage capacity uh, in the soil. Um, you have soil erosion from wind and rain. And then uh, you end up having conditions in the root zone because the picture on the right illustrates um, the ceiling and it doesn't allow water infiltration, but it doesn't allow air infiltration. And so you have anaerobic conditions building up in the soil root zone and that is, uh, those are good disease causing conditions. So you don't want to have that. Um, So the reason I put this up, um, sand clay particles, um, these particles, they, all soils have some proportion of sand, silt, and clay particles. These particles, uh, for a highly functioning soil, these particles need to be aggregated together. Uh, when they fall apart, you, what happens when they fall apart, there's no infiltration, you get those seals, the clay seals seals the surface of the soil um, and the aggregation only happens in biologically active soils and that's due to some of these soil glues uh, such as glomalins. We only discovered glomalins uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, that's a soil glue from fungi. Um, bacteria also um, secrete polysaccharides which act like glues and uh, these aggregate the sand silt and clay soil particles and that's it's a good thing in the next slide okay um, I want to thank David Granitstein for this um, slide I used this in many presentations but so he took a couple root balls from adjacent farms uh, same same soil type, uh, but the root ball on the left uh, that has a lot of roots showing, um, that root ball was taken from uh, uh, what I call a heavily conventional farm. Lots of chemical fertilizers, lots of pesticides, corn and corn, uh, no cover crops, uh, and the use of big equipment. Um, the root ball on the right was taken from a conventional farm, but they used a good crop rotation of three or four different crops. They used cover crops. They used manure as uh, a main fertilizer. And um, they had lighter, and they were also lighter on chemical applications. And so what David did, he just applied a garden hose to each of these root balls. The one on the left, the soil disappeared after about 30 seconds because there was no, nothing holding the soil together. There are no, there's no biology holding that soil together to keep that um, around the roots. And if you extrapolate that out to a landscape scale, that gets kind of scary. The one on the right, he put, uh, he kept that garden hose on there for a few minutes and that's the result. It didn't wash away because there's biology keeping that soil active and, and keeping it together.
King. I apologize for the slowness of these slides there. Um, there we go. Okay. Even though the soil maintains its uh, integrity around the roots, the aggregates allow better infiltration of um, the water. And so you can see um, on the right here, that's kind of a diagram that illustrates that uh, walnut orchard floor. The clay particles form a seal and then the rest of the water runs off. It doesn't go into the root zone. It does go into the water table ultimately. Uh, and so what happens if the surface doesn't stay on the surface, but if you invest in your soils, if you um, start thinking about managing them as, a, as an ecology, then you can start developing your soil structure, you'll have better infiltration, and lots of positive things happen. So, Again, you know, where in nature do you see uh, vast stretches of bare ground for months at a time? That's, uh, I, I, this is, you know, there may be good agronomic reasons for that, but um, it, you're kind of starving the soil, particularly in California. You see uh, this a lot in um, uh, over there's a lot of bare soil. It's not cover crop, and you're exposing the uh, that soil to. Uh, but there's a lot of soils, you know, a lot of um, cropping ground. Annual cropping ground is now being converted to orchards: almonds, walnuts, uh, pecans, and pistachios uh, everywhere in California. And so these conservation, there's a lot of conservation opportunities, particularly in uh, the orchard sector sector, because uh, for almonds and walnuts, especially, you know, there there are issues associated with harvesting the walnuts and almonds are are shaken and then the nuts fall on the ground and they're windrowed and then they're swept up. But for the first few years of these new orchards, there's no production, and so um, not uh, put in a cover crop and you know help that soil help maintain your soil quality and, and help the tree and the orchard system at the same time. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on orchards because there's so much orchard product in California. Uh, but a lot of these um, techniques or ideas or approaches are useful in annual crop systems as well. Uh, not so much chipping prunings, but uh, this is uh, one way to add carbon back into the soil, you know, or use it, you know, keep it as a mulch. Uh, it protects the soil. And I still see, you know, this last weekend, uh, I saw a lot of folks uh, doing burn piles and burning prunings, and I, I consider that, and like, shoot, it's too bad they're not chipping in and putting them in uh, the orchard floor because they grew the carbon and uh, you don't want to just burn off the carbon that you grew. And cover crops also are, uh, especially in new orchards, uh, orchards, and you can grow a, I'm sorry, There we go. You can grow a, a cash crop. You can grow uh, wheat hay or uh, some other crop. <sighs> Sorry about that. There we go. So new orchards, uh, you know, cover crops are uh, very beneficial. Certainly there are considerations for orchard floor management, uh, needing to have clean floors uh, for harvest, but 
um, especially for almond growers, um, I think that's uh, something you want to consider. Um, and there's a growing number of of almond growers that uh, benefit from this, they have reduced cracking in the high clay soils, they have better uh, infiltration, even reduced pollination costs, and sometimes uh, reduced uh, nematode counts. Compost uh, is another form of organic matter, and you know, all of these are not uh, incompatible. You can use compost, you can use cover crops, chip your prunings. They're all diverse sources of organic matter, and they'll all feed uh, kind of a different set of uh, microbes. So um, compost is a, another form, and uh, um, CDFA has a healthy soils program that will provide up to $50 a ton of compost, uh, up to six to eight tons per acre. So that's a pretty good deal. Uh, and uh, NCAT has been signed up as a technical assistance provider on these things. So if you're interested, uh, give us a call. What I'm talking about is investing in your soils, meaning organic matter in your soils in, in whatever way you can, you know, crop residues, compost, cover crops, um, but just uh, getting uh, more organic matter into your soils, it, it will help sandy soils retain uh, more water. It will help sandy soils retain more nutrients, and sandy soils are, are particularly poor at, at both of those. And uh, it'll help clay soils too. Uh, putting cover crops in clay soils will help them uh, absorb um, water. You won't get as much standing water uh, in heavy soils. So a lot of positives. Um, cover crops do require management and uh, there's much of an art as it is a science to cover crop production, but you know there are these um, different approaches and different opportunities to invest in your soil to kind of bring it back and, and make it a lot more functioning. Um, NRCS has uh, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and EFA's Healthy Soils Program. So there are financial uh, cost shares that are available to growers uh, across the country as well as in California. Um, ATRA, NCAT manages the ATRA project. Uh, ATRA has a lot of information on uh, soil management, compost, uh, the soil resource, et cetera, just ATTRA. Uh, there are some other sources. Uh, the web soil survey, as Steve mentioned, SARE has a very good uh, building soils for better crop. It's a great primer uh, if you're just learning about soils. Uh, Cornell has a soil health training manual. Um, good farmers that are knowledgeable about soils are probably your best um, your best resource, actually. And NRCS has a pretty good uh, soil biology primer. And a few other resources. Um, the biology of soil compaction. I think uh, compaction is often overlooked as a, a problem in soils, but uh, even animals can compact soil. So um, if you have, uh, even chickens can do uh, soil compaction. So um, keep that in mind. Organic Center as assessing soil quality and organic agriculture. Um, but well-managed soils. I don't want to uh, point the finger at organic agriculture, the end all and be all of soil management. Uh, Atra publications. Sorry, I went too far. So um, that's it. I apologize for the kind of delay on the slide uh, progression. That. Um, great. Thank I, you, Rex. I, that was a really great presentation. And um, connection is maybe not up to snuff. So yeah, no, Rex, that was um, really great. And thanks for presenting, even though the slides were going a little slow for you. Um, so if you have questions for Rex, please write in. Um, and we'll start with questions just for Rex, and then we'll open it up to both uh, Rex and Steve. And um, 
One question we have is that uh, you talked some about orchard management and cover crops. Um, what do you recommend for vegetable crops? I would say it depends on what your goals for the cover crop are. Um, you know, is your soil low in organic matter? You might want to plant uh, some kind of small grain or something that would give you biomass. You know, um, I've helped a farmer transition some ground from conventional to organic production using just uh, primarily just small grains, and uh, that worked quite well. But it depends on your goal uh, on the crop. If you're low on nitrogen, if you're want to have if you're going to be planting some or some something that's a heavy nitrogen feeder you might want to put in a, a cover crop of uh exclusively legumes like vetch or bell beans or some um a mix of cover crops gives you what I call germination ins insurance. Even a mix of legumes, you know, like if uh, bell beans uh, don't do well in your type of soil, or maybe the weather is just not suitable for uh, bell beans that particular spring, or whenever you planted it, uh, maybe the vetch will do better, or maybe the Austrian pea, or maybe you're using uh, some other legume, uh, clover or something. But um, a mix gives you some germination experience or uh, insurance that uh, I think is valuable. Great, thanks. And then someone else is also wondering um, the growers that you work with that have animals incorporated into their um, operations, how are they co managing the animals with food safety? Yeah, very good question. And, you know, the food safety rule requires that um, any animals, if, if you're growing, say, vegetable crops that uh, come in contact with the ground, uh, you need to get them off 120 days before harvest of whatever vegetable or, you know, crop you're doing. For tree crops, it's uh, 90 days. Um, but I suspect uh, for almonds and walnuts, because they're shaken and they land on the ground, uh, it would be 120 days as well. And I've seen, um, you just got to know, know your animals. Uh, I've seen uh, sheep. sheep being um, used to grade the gas cover in walnut orchards. Uh, you just got to get them off in time. and know your animal too because you don't want your uh sheep you know if you leave them on too long they'll start kind of nibbling at your, at the bark of the walnut trees or you know you, you have to know your animals the capabilities and and you have to have a system of moving them around and making sure that uh your grounds uh free of the manure uh by the time you harvest that crop so the food safety question is a good one. Um, and if you have some, if you're concerned about that, you can uh, maybe uh, do a, a bacterial test on your soils, you know, for salmonella or, you know, whatever uh, uh, um, pathogen you're, you're looking at. Great, thank you. Um, and also just to add to that uh, Wild Farm Alliance has a lot of good resources kind of on managing food safety and conservation. Um, and uh, the Community Alliance with Family Farmers also has um, a lot of good food safety information out there as well. So, um, and we can send out some links to those resources. Uh, we had another question come in that, um, is asking, what are your thoughts or suggestions for producing enough of your own organic matter on the farm other than animal manure? How do we produce more organic matter without extracting it from elsewhere? 
I would say if you're not bringing in organic matter from outside, you know, like uh, there's on-farm composting that can be done, but that brings in organic matter from the outside. Um, just growing cover crops, you know, during the winter, um, depending on where you're at in California or where you're at in the country, you know, um, in California, <laughs> winter is our wet season and uh, most places don't freeze. And so if you plant, say, a vetch cover in uh, October, November, uh, it's the soil's warm enough, it'll, it'll germinate and then kind of get real colder, rainier months and then it'll take off again. But you can grow biomass uh, using um, cover crops, but also, um, so I'm married into a farm family and uh, my brother-in-law uh, farms organic ground, several hundred acres, and uh, he harvests, he grows corn, um, but he just harvests the cob and he leaves all in the in the field and that's a huge amount of bio mass it's a lot of carbon but his soils you know he's been doing this for for opportunities to leave organic matter you know if you're growing a small grain you could harvest the head and just maybe not harvest the the straw for straw bales just leave that in the ground uh, uh, overwintering mulch uh, something like that just look for opportunities to leave uh, crop residue in the field great thank you and then one more question is if someone was interested in um, working with NRCS or taking advantage of these California Healthy Soils programs, um, what's the best way, kind of what's the process that you would go through? How do you contact the person? Is there an application? Um, if you could talk a little bit about that. Ah, uh, yes. Um, if you're looking for um, Natural Resources Conservation Service generally has um, a county office in most counties in California and actually across the country. Um, the areas might, you know, might have to go to the adjacent county, but talk to your local soil conservationist or your local district conservationist. You can go on the website. Uh, on internet for uh, NRCS uh, uh, field office locations and it'll generate out of the US and you can click on your state and then it'll um, eventually you can click on your, your county and find the contact information NRCS office. If you're in California um, you can want to access uh, or uh, you can give NCAT or some, there's other uh, folks like CAF and there, there are gonna be a bunch of technical assistance providers for the Healthy Soils Program. Uh, the Healthy Soils Program will be putting out their request for grant applications, meaning you know their cost share application. It's in January or early February. And then uh, they'll just uh, go to the CDFA Healthy Soils Program. You'll, uh, they will have a list of technical assistance providers. Uh, hopefully their online application will be simpler than the previous uh, couple of iterations. Um, we've helped folks I we've applied on behalf of uh, some folks that are Spanish speakers. Uh, yes, I'm, go to that website, the CDFA Healthy Soils Program website, and uh, you'll be able to find a technical assistance provider that's operating in your area, or give NCAT a call because we're going to be one of those. Great, thank you very much. 
So I think we're going to wrap things up, but thank you again, Steve and Rex, um, for your presentations and taking some time to walk us through, um, you know, the benefits of both uh, managing your soil and irrigation systems well um, to make good use of water um, and the best use of your soil. So thank you for participating. Um, and we'll just have a few wrap-up slides. Um, CCOF has some webinars coming up this winter. We're having an organic seedling production webinar at the end of January, and then a disaster preparedness webinar for livestock operations in February. And then at the end of February, there's the annual CCOF meeting in Sacramento. It's a good way to connect with people in person. So thank you again for joining us today. And um, please fill out your evaluation form. When you, uh, we close out of the webinar, it'll pop up. And we always love getting feedback and ideas on what we can do future trainings on, as well as how we can improve our offerings. And just to note that that survey is not anonymous. The way GoToWebinar does their surveys is it's attached to your name. But we appreciate all types of feedback, even um, on what we can improve. So thank you again, everybody, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>